Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us for our Java licensing changes webinar. Before we get started, we want to go over a few announcements. We could switch to the next slide. Thank you. Um, we will be recording this webinar and it will be distributed at the conclusion of the follow-up email. We also want to encourage participation, so all questions and polls will be anonymous. And if you have questions, please type them into the chat box at the bottom of the screen in your Zoom control panel. If we don't get to your question immediately, we will address it at the end during the question and answer portion of the presentation. And lastly, we want to let you know about our upcoming webinars on SAP's digital access. There will be two webinars, one for the US on February 19th and another for the UK um, on February 20th. We will include a link to register for that in our follow-up email. That is it for announcements. And now without further ado, we will switch it over to the presenters for introductions. Thanks. Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, my name is Nathaniel Serrano and welcome to our presentation of Java licensing changes. A uh, quick introduction on myself and Delia. Uh, my name is Nathaniel Serrano, again, a senior license consultant over here at Angle Point. Uh, previous to this job here, I was with Oracle LMS North America as a senior consultant for over four years. Uh, I consider myself a full stack auditor uh, all the way from the actual qualification and targeting of potential audit audits previously with Oracle all the way through the entire audit process, uh, finishing with the deal resolution and management. Uh, I developed the Oracle LMS North American targeting initiative, identifying high risk compliance customers. Uh, on to you, Delia. Thanks, Nate. Uh, hi, everybody. Thank you for joining our session today. My name is Delia Cuellar, and I am a senior consultant with Inglepoint's Oracle team. And prior to joining Inglepoint, I also worked with Oracle's license management team, um, where I focused on unlimited license agreements and also performed advisory services for Oracle key account customers in North America. Um, so primarily focusing on contract interpretation, and legal escalations as well as software audits. So here's our agenda for today. We'll be starting off with a brief overview of Java and discuss the various installers and components which make up Java SE and Java SE commercial programs. Okay, next we'll focus on determining Java licensing. Uh, just a general overview of Java licensing. Um, we're going to run through a few key questions that should highlight the binary code and license agreement that's going to help you determine Java licensing, whether it's free, whether it's not, and when it becomes licensable. Uh, first question we'll touch on is, do you need updates to security patches since the new changes to Java are primarily around support? Uh, next, we're going to focus on commercial features and if they're in use, uh, what the purpose and functionality of your Java support application is, and then when is Java actually free of versus when it's licensable? Then we'll be reviewing the licensing options and the pricing models available and discussing next steps. Okay, so a brief history of Java and its comprising components. Okay, so Java is a commercial programming language that's specifically designed to have as few implementation dependencies as possible. So by design, it allows developers to write once and run everywhere. And Java was initially developed by Sun Microsystems under a proprietary license until 2007 when it was released as a free and open source software under the governing terms and conditions of the GNU general public license policy. In 2010, Oracle acquired Sun Microsystems and following the acquisition, Oracle actually maintained Java as a free product under the terms and conditions of the Oracle Binary Code License Agreement. And this is the version of Java that most people think of when Java comes to mind. So it's free of use uh, under an Oracle Restricted Use Agreement. Uh, however, in 2011, Oracle introduced two new commercial Java licenses, which are Java SE Advanced and Java SE Suite, and one more in 2014. And most recently, and probably the reason why most of you are here today, is Oracle's 2018 announcement that it will no longer provide free public updates of Java SE 8 for commercial users. So personal users, uh, which are individuals using Java SE, will actually have a longer window until December of 2020. 
So before we discuss the licensing portion, it's important to understand how the various types of Java are downloaded. So on this slide, we have a list of the different Java installers, and these are packages which must be downloaded individually. So the combination of these installers and its components are ultimately what create the Java program. So no one installer on its own is mapped to a specific program. So for example, to obtain the basic functionality of Java SE, you'll need to download Java Runtime Environment and one of the Java development kits. So for example, JDK. If in addition to this, you also require use of the Java commercial features, you'll need to download Java uh, Runtime Environment, um, JDK, and at least one more of the installer packages with the components that you're looking for. So this is a really important concept to grasp because any use of the commercial features, um, which we'll talk about later, are licensable, um, is a clear deliberate use, at least to the point of download. Now, if you're familiar with Oracle's Database Enterprise Edition, you may know that the options and packs already come pre-installed with the database but this isn't the case here. So JRE and JDK can make up the core product, but any additional installers are needed for more features and functionality. Here we have the components of basic Java SE installers, which you can see are Java Development Kit, Java Runtime Environment, Java FX Runtime, and JRocket JDK. So again, all of these are part of the basic Java SE. Okay, now here we're getting to the licensable components, which are the Java SC commercial features. So uh, on the left column, we see that we have the name of the component, and in the middle two columns, the components are mapped to the commercial Java license, so either Java SC Advanced, Advanced Desktop, or Java SC Suite. Since these components provide additional functionality to the basic Java SC, any use of these would actually trigger a licensing event. Um, I also wanted to point out that although this isn't part of Oracle's recent policy change, it's important to understand all aspects of Java licensing to make sure that your organization is fully compliant. So there are currently five different types of Java licenses, or I'm sorry, of Java types from Oracle. Um, so here's a breakdown of what's free from a high level versus what's licensable. So starting off with the free category, we see that we have Oracle JDK, which still remains open source. Uh, and then we have Java Standard Edition, which again is free if no support is required from Oracle, and if it's used within the terms and restrictions of the binary code license agreement, which we'll get to in a few minutes. Moving on to what's licensable, uh, and here we have a note for production environments so, um, that will also come into play later, is Java SC, if support is needed from Oracle, that will need a license and uh, the following commercial programs will also require a license. So Java SE Advanced, Java SE Advanced Desktop, and Java SE Suite. And lastly, we also have uh, any Java embedded products, which will also need to be licensed, and these are governed by a different contract called the Java Binary License Redistribution Agreement. Okay, thanks, Delia. Uh, now we're gonna jump into determining Java licensing. This is when is Java free and what makes Java license. Okay, so jumping in, Java is free when it's used within the terms and restrictions outlined in the binary code and license agreement. This is commonly gonna be referred to as the BCLA, uh, not only throughout this presentation, but throughout any Oracle white papers, any Oracle deliverables, this is generally what it's gonna be referred to as. Um, as we're walking through the determining Java licensing section, we're gonna take a look at four key questions uh, these key questions are set to highlight the latest Oracle Java SE changes and the major components of the BCLA. So as opposed to walking you through the very heavy language in the BCLA, we're going to step through a few questions uh, in hopes to shed light on what the binary code license agreement is trying to depict to you, as well as the new changes to the Java SE policy. Um, Stepping into the first question, you know, we're gonna, re, we're gonna run through these on the following slides, but I'm gonna give you a few highlights here. Do you need updates and security patches? The latest changes to Oracle Java SE policies revolve around support. When Oracle is referring to support, yes, it's maintenance, but here we're primarily talking about version updates and security patches, just plain and simple. Uh, are commercial Java's features being used? Delia just provided a table listing all licensable commercial features. These have always been licensable with one caveat, 
uh, test dev, but we'll touch on that in just a minute in the following slides. Um, I know there's a lot of commercial features on the earlier table, probably too many to remember. So let's just say that everything that's not a base Java SE component is a commercial feature. And when I'm saying base Java components, uh, we're talking about the various Java development kits uh, used for actually creating Java-based applications and the runtime environments. Um, the runtime environments are essentially the platform to actually run somebody else's Java application. So when we're talking commercial features, we're not talking about the development kits or the actual runtime environments. We're talking about things that are more along the lines of performance and scalability. Um, performance and scalability, you know, mass, ex mass deployments of your Java environment, uh, sort of diagnostics or tracking tools just to manage the performance of your actual Java deployed applications. So when we're talking commercial features, more performance and scalability. Uh, next we're going to step into what type of environment and what is the purpose and functionality of the Java supported applications. We'll touch on these in just a moment. These have a little bit more detail, a little bit more than we can highlight on this one slide. So we'll get there. Okay. So again, Java licenses are required for Java SE deployments where Oracle support is needed. Um, if you need version updates and security patches, there's really nothing else to it. Either buy support subscriptions or you could do a full rip and replace to an open JDK platform, which is free. Um, probably not the most fun task. And even then you may become dependent on public updates and patches, which may not be the greatest for you. Um, an open JDK platform might not be recommended for uh, those of you that have mission, crit mission critical applications or certain types of environments where there's uh, heavy customer security, heavy data flow in and out, probably not recommended. And those of you uh, are probably going to jump towards a subscription for Java. Uh, it's just my take on it. Uh, next, we're going to jump into the commercial features. Uh, again, we're going to be referencing the binary code and license agreement. We suggest you take a look at the BCLA yourself uh, for commercial features, specifically Section A commercial features. Um, again, if you're trying to figure out what are commercial features, it's everything above the base, JDK and JRE environments, development kits and runtime environments. Um, if you'd like, follow us up with an email and we can send over the information in a PDF with all the different features and some links in the BCLA. Uh, highlighting certain parts of the commercial Java components. We can do that for you. But again, usage of Java commercial features uh, for any commercial use or production purposes violates the terms and restrictions of the BCLA and therefore licensable. These have always been licensable. Um, it's coming to light now that, you know, there may be fear of audit and you're getting calls from Oracle. You're requesting that you buy these subscriptions. If you didn't have them before, you should have. Um, quick note, test development rights are granted under the BCLA. So if you are using commercial features within the BCLA, uh, test development rights, you're okay. Uh, and that's going to take us into our next question. What type of environment is Java deployed in? Uh, again, if we recommend you take a look at the BCLA, uh, for here specifically section B software internal use for development license grant. Uh, Oracle grants you the non-exclusive, non-transferable, limited license without fees to reproduce internally and use internally the software complete and unmodified for the purpose of designing, developing, and testing your programs. Uh, is this, if this is a tested and dev environment, I mean, I would expect you're using this internally and not breaking that, that, that terms and restrictions. Uh, notice we highlight complete and unmodified. You are going to see that throughout this presentation. Uh, modifications on their own trigger licensing uh, to any of the Java applications wherever in use. Uh, and that's also going to bring us to our next slide. Uh, quick note, any commercial or production use makes test dev environments licensable. So, okay, yes, you do have the right to test dev Java uh, applications, use Java development applications. Um, but as soon as you go into commercial use or production use, everything becomes licensable, including that test dev environment. So you do have free use as long as there are no commercial or production environments in play. Uh, here's where it gets tricky or a lot of 
times people overlook. Uh, what is the purpose and functionality of Java supported applications? Subject to the terms and conditions of the Oracle binary code and license agreement, Oracle grants a non-exclusive, non-transferable, limited license without license fees to reproduce and use internally the software complete and unmodified for the sole purpose of running general purpose use programs. Um, so why we're asking you, what is the purpose of the functionality of the Java supported application? Defined here in the BCLA, general purpose use is kind of left open, but they give examples of email, internet browsing, office suite productivity tools. Uh, but you notice it says, such as, but not specifically limited to email, general purpose internet browsing and office suite productivity tools. So the BCLA is left open, uh, it's vague and open to interpretation. Um, but as far as non-general purpose use, which has always been licensable, uh, I believe most people should know when they're commercially using Java. And not, let's not say commercially using as in commercial features, but you're actually providing this as a solution to somebody. Uh, you're providing this as internally for a specific application function within your business. This is a business critical application. So here we're talking about dedicated functionality or embedded or function specific software applications. Um, people often get mixed up between embedded and unmodified. So some people will use the Java just as the engine for their function specific application. Uh, it may not be modified, but then again, you're breaking the term and restriction uh, for dedicated functionality. And then others who are building homegrown applications on a Java based platform, more likely than not, you're making modifications. I would say majority of the time you're making modifications. I'm not too sure if many people on the call are aware of e-business suite and the modification rules. Um, it's very, very similar. You make any little adjustment to Oracle logos, Oracle objects, libraries, class files, uh, source code is obvious, but you know, any little adjustment is gonna make this licensable. So anything that you're using for homegrown applications, more likely than not, it's already modified, if not already used for some specific dedicated functionality and should have always been licensable. So after reviewing those questions, when is Java free? Again, you guys are gonna get a copy of these slides so you can take this, ask yourself the question, go back to your team, review it with them. Um, but Java SE products are free when? Java does not require the updates and patches. Commercial features are not leveraged in production environments, used in test development, and Java programs are unmodified across the board. Uh, Java is used for general purpose computers, for general computing functions, and not for dedicated functionality or embedded for function specific software applications. Uh, or if Java is already included for use with other Oracle products. We're gonna jump into our next section, licensing or license options with Delia, and I'm sure we're gonna have a bunch of questions on what was just covered. Feel free to enter them in the chat. We're also gonna have a question and answer section so we can get to a lot of it there. Um, but for now, we're gonna to get to license options with Delia, uh, where we're gonna start off where Java is already covered with Oracle products. Thanks, Nate. Uh, so once you've gone through that series of questions and you've figured out whether or not your Java usage needs licensing, then you can start thinking about your licensing options. So if you're already an Oracle customer, the first step that we recommend is to check whether any of your usage is actually covered through an existing Oracle program license. And so here we have on the column on the left, it shows us the Oracle products which have the Java SE already included as a component. And this means that if the Java usage is mapped back to any of these programs, then you're already covered and there's no need to double license them. Keep in mind though that uh, the pro pro programs marked here with an asterisk, um, these include the Java SE component, but it's within a restricted right to make use of Java SE, but only for that specific application. Uh, so PeopleSoft, for example, includes the Java SE, but it's restricted to the use of PeopleSoft or people to applications only. So in case you're still in need of additional licensing after filtering out the Java usage, which is covered through your existing Oracle licenses, let's review the pricing models. So here we have Oracle's legacy pricing for on-prem commercial features. 
However, Oracle has actually moved this price list to what they call controlled availability, which means that in order to get this pricing, uh, it will require special approvals from Oracle sales and um, everything will have to be analyzed on a case by case basis. Now, with that being said, if you're in need of additional licensing, then these licenses will likely be sold to you in a subscription model. And that's just the route that Oracle is moving as a whole. It's just a shift that the company is making. And as you can see here, it only includes two different license types. And the difference between these two is really the metric. So Java SC desktop is on a named user plus metric and Java SC subscription is on the processor metric. So um, whichever metric is right for you and your organization, uh, either one will get you access to Oracle support as well as the Java commercial features. And with that, I'll turn it back to Nate so he can walk us through next steps. You know, actually, quick thought on what you just covered between the on-prem model and the subscription model. Um, talking about the controlled availability. Looking at the numbers, it seems that the subscription models are going to be the most cost-efficient model for customers that, are small, that have smaller environments. Uh, obviously, customers that have very, very, very large server environments uh, some of these job subscriptions, the pricing is probably not going to hold very efficient. Uh, and that's probably when you're going to start stepping into unlimited license agreements and things like that for on-prem. So that's why the things are controlled availability. And yeah. So if it doesn't make sense, um, you know, the metric, the quantities, the pricing, something that's really important to keep in mind is that with Oracle, uh, if it's not right for your company, mostly everything is negotiable. So, um, you know, we had another webinar on uh, audit support and uh, Nate talks about that um, a lot more there in detail, but keeping things in mind such as working uh, on their sales cycle, their quarter ends and things like that can really help you leverage, uh, you know, different things that you're trying to get in your order documents. Um, so now we're going to jump into where should, where should customers start? Um, this whole Java thing is a bit confusing, so hopefully we can push you in the right direction. Uh, First, let's start with mapping. Um, mapping your environment, this should be done not only for Java deployments, but just for any software deployments. First, you're gonna to wanna to map your Java deployments to the servers, virtual machines, or desktops that they're actually being distributed on. Uh, and then from there, you take that mapping and map them to specific applications. Uh, and then from there, what type of environment is it? Test, dev, production. So say you have uh, Java deployment, Java SE8 on server one, running homegrown application one in a production environment, right? So this should be done whether you have a uh, Flexera, Snow, uh, some, you know, maybe some just Excel, app Excel table that you have running. It's always best to map. Uh, and this is something that you should always adjust as you're changing your environment. There should be some process in place to monitor changes and you should be changing this mapping as your environment is changing and growing and migrating from data center to data center as is. Um, once you have that map, then we can best determining your, you know, then we can best determine your need for license. Uh, we've identified the Java usage in different groups. So now we can prioritize, right? Obviously Java environments that require updates and security patches, there's no negotiation here. If you need it, you have to get it. Um, so that's where we would start, right? This is, this is mission critical. Uh, they've already ended. You need a license for updates and security patches. If this is something you've been waiting on, you should probably put, put your ducks in order for updates and security patches now. Um, next, we would take a look at Java environments that use commercial Java features. Um, Companies may not have had these things licensed because honestly the installers and the executable packages were most likely available and are well, not anymore, but they were available. They were always licensable. So companies may have been using them, not knowing they were licensable, but they are, and they always have been. Um, so we would begin, you know, taking that mapping for all the commercial features, all the commercial executables and, and start planning budget there. Uh, then systems and solutions that provide dedicated functionality or design for embedded or function specific software applications. Um, these are your homegrown applications or devices like an ATM or uh, 
a handheld scanner, something that are doing very function specific. Again, these have always have been licensable, but people probably have not prioritized them or just didn't understand that they were licensable. Uh, and again, modified Java. Anytime you make a modification to Java, whatever that application may be, the Java is already licensable. Right. So we would, we would take these in this order, updates, commercial features, dedicated functionality, uh, modified. Once you have this down, you understand what's licensing, what's licensable, what needs to be licensed. Uh, then let's determine who's gonna cover these licensing needs. You know, one, is it covered by Oracle? Like Delia said earlier, uh, a lot of these middleware products, a lot of Oracle applications come with, a lot of Oracle software comes with Java included. So you wouldn't have to purchase an additional license where you're Oracle, where you're already running Oracle software. Most likely it's already covered by Oracle. Uh, if you have a homegrown application or, you know, internal devices, this is something your company is most likely going to have to pay for. And then third, since you mapped all the rest of the applications out, we will take all our third party application vendors uh, and see if the licenses are covered by them. You should have that discussion with your Adobe's and your IBM's and your Microsoft's. Uh, do you need to pick up a license or did they already pick up a redi redistributable license that's going to cover uh, everybody's that's purchasing their software? So these are the three buckets you should be landing in. Does Oracle pay? Will you pay? Or will any other third-party application vendor pay? Uh, that takes us into the title of our presentation, Mountain or Molehill. With such widespread use of Java combined with proactive customer contact by Oracle sales rep, I'm sure there's no wonder why there's so much panic in the market, right? So Oracle has been calling everybody like crazy saying, hey, you need these subscriptions. Right? There's no way around it. Um, like I said here, take a step back, breathe and break down the facts, right? Mountain or molehill. Um, as far as Java environments that require updates and security patches, we say this one's a mountain and we would get up it if you need it, right? If it's mission critical, if there's data security involved, uh, I probably wouldn't rely on public patches and updates. This is probably something that you're going to want to get done relatively soon, especially because the updates and patches are ending. Right. January 19th was the cutoff. Uh, for everything else, a mountain or a molehill, you decide and take priority. Um, there have been talks of Oracle audits, and I'm sure that will begin at some point. They have a Java usage tracking tool that has a lot of cool features that can pick up some commercial features, check some of the class libraries and things like that. Um, but I'm sure their program is still in development right now. There's a big sales push to get everybody on, on the subscription models. So I think they're going to start there. And then, you know, as time goes on, the audit proc, the audit program will probably begin to develop. So for the things that you would consider a mountain, don't go full sprint up the mountain. I would, you know, set a path and start hiking, not, not calm and collective and just get to the top where you need to for the things that are molehills, take a step back and, you know, plan fiscally, you know, your budget and get those done as you see fit. So commercial features, these are going to be the first things that Oracle is going to be able to audit. They're cut and dry. You should have already been licensing them. They have a tool that's going to be able to detect it. Um, so these environments, if you're not going to license them right away, you know, license your security patch and update environments first, take a step back. So probably commercial features are going to be the next things you want to get checked off the list. Uh, Third, dedicated functionality or embedded function-specific software. This is going to be a little bit harder to audit. It's going to take a lot of customer declaration. Um, and, and then you're going to also have to allow Oracle to run these on your homegrown applications and things of that nature uh, to check for modifications. To You're going to have to declare to them what the application actually specifically is doing. You're going to have to locate the application for them and run the tool on your server uh, and then provide the data from that tool back to them. So these are still important, you know, molehills, we would consider them for now. Um, so again, priority in these key topics, we're going mountain down to molehill. It's a little combination of both. Um, but again, don't go license your entire environment all the way around, break them down into application vendors, uh, security and patch updates, see who's going to pay for what, have the discussions and then start to
Yep. Um, and so just to address one of the questions that came in here around when Oracle is going to be uh, auditing Java. So as Nate mentioned, um, they haven't released anything yet. There's been no official communication that they will be auditing Java, uh, but it is likely just a matter of time. Um, right now, the ownership is on the end user and on the customer to figure out whether or not they need the updates and security patches. So they're pushing that back on you. Uh, but when it comes to the commercial Java features, these are something that can be mapped, can be picked up with various tools. And um, when Oracle does start auditing Java, we would imagine that that would be their main, their main focus. Since uh, everything else, you know, there's a lot of legality and, um, you know, customer declaration and issues and stuff that would come with it. So not to say that they wouldn't do it, um, but likely not where they're going to start. And with that, we'll pass it back to Scott Hare. No, thanks you guys for walking through that. Uh, very good job explaining that. Uh, there are a number of good questions. We're going to make sure that we have some time here still on the call to uh, to be able to answer some of those key questions. What, what I encourage as well is obviously in a webinar type format, it's challenging to, to have the interactive discussion and uh, all your questions answered. There might be a fear of asking uh, questions that you might feel are, are, are maybe not appropriate for a group setting like this or maybe uh, for, for other reasons. And so, you know, Oracle licensing as a whole is challenging. Adding in the Java uh, nuances here that we've been able to discuss today obviously add to that complexity and, and, and the challenges as an organization. Uh, these are the types of things, though, Anglepoint you know, provides and offers to organizations is to help through some of these challenges. And so if you'd like to be able to engage in more of a one-on-one -on -one setting with Nate and Delia on the line here, um, you know, please reach out to us. There's an email address here. You can come to our website. On the website, you can request for a, uh, a meeting. You can actually request specific times and get something scheduled like that. Uh, that will come back through to me and uh, Nate and Delia. So we'll be able to work closely with you to, to schedule some time that works for you and talk uh, more in depth one on one. But this is what we do uh, as an organization is to, to help with these types of complexities and challenges. Um, whether your questions are specific to Java or broader for, for Oracle licensing as a whole, or perhaps you're talking more uh, systemic challenges when it comes to software asset management and tooling, uh, we'd love to have that conversation with you. So uh, with that said, I think we can move into the uh, Q&A session here a little bit more uh, detailed. Uh, Deli and Nate, do you guys want to read through some of those and uh, again, we may not be able to get to all of them. Some of the questions may not be appropriate for a group setting as well. So I'll, I'll let you, you kind of use your discretion as we go through that. Uh, yeah, before we do that, let's just jump to this last announcement here. Um, oh, I forgot about that. Yeah, good point, guys. So so there are some upcoming events just to, to restate there. And thanks for keeping me honest on that, Nate. Um, we do have a Java licensing changes on demand recording that will be coming out. Um, we do have an upcoming blog that's going to be uh, posted soon after um, the presentation here today. So you get an opportunity to read more in depth or to review the, the recording from today's session. Uh, just as another reminder, the SAP Digital Access, a paradigm shift in SAP licensing webinar. Uh, we're going to be hosting two different uh, options for that one here in the U.S. on the 19th and one addressing out of uh, kind of the Europe and APAC regions for us on February 20th. So we hope you'll find an opportunity to join us for some of the upcoming webinars as well. Okay, cool. Uh, let's jump into these Q and question as answered. Look, we got a lot of them here. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah, Nate, I was just going to say some questions have come in through the actual chat and some have come in through the Q&A module as well. So. Um, maybe while you're answering one question, Delia, if you can kind of scan through as well, we'll try to hit what we can here with the, the remaining time. And then, like I said, there might be some questions where, uh, you know, we may reach out for more of a one-on-one -on -one, uh, opportunity to talk. Sure. Okay, so starting off with the first question we see here, can I license a server with a nut metric? Um, so the answer is yes, you're not licensing the server per se, but you would be licensing the user's um, from the Java from that server. So uh, the metric you pick is entirely up to you. The named user plus metric is recommended when you can actually count 
who's using the software versus the server metric or the processor metric, which is recommended when um, it's a bit harder to count and you just rather license the whole server. Yeah, and when we're talking name user, we're actually talking about the end user. We're not talking about some batch that's coming through in one big bundle of, yeah. of even in one process. It's the actual end user. Yeah, and for uh, as part of the definition, the name user plus could be human or non-human. So it's important to keep in mind as well. Do I have to license a server with processor subscriptions and also NUPS for the clients which access the server? No, if you have it licensed on the processor, that's covering everything. As long as your server has enough bandwidth to handle all the users, uh, you're good to go. And then if you need to step up from there, just spin up new machines and license more processors. But once you're licensed on Prox on a machine, anybody and everybody can access it as long as your system can handle it. Yeah, so that'll cover everybody um, or again, if you choose the net metric, then that's fine, but then you'll be having to count the end user. So everybody from the front end to the back end. Dev test environments, is there a specific channel to obtain Java updates? That's a good question. Uh, so when you are using the Java SE packages, no, there is not. Um, but then again, it's test dev. Uh, you shouldn't really require that many security patches and updates. And then once you go live, you'd have to purchase anyways and you could upgrade. So, I mean, at that point, but then again, there is open JDK, which is Oracle's platform, which they are starting to build off Java SE 11 so that they become almost interchangeable. And then those are open to public updates. So, uh, you can use an open JDK platform, uh, and basically build there and use the publicly available patches and updates that are coming it's every six months. Yeah. Every six months. Mm -hmm. And then hopefully once everything's ready and finished on your side, you can go ahead and transition over to a, you know, buy some licenses and switch over to a Java SE build. Uh, that's, that's Oracle's plan. So that's why Oracle has their open JDK. They're hoping, you know, they, they want people to, to test and develop applications on their Java. So they're trying to make it simple for you to jump from one to the other. Okay. Um, okay, another question here says, is there any kind of minimum NUP amount? So that's a good question. So on an on-prem scenario, there uh, typically would be, because in this case, it's uh, moving towards a subscription model, then the minimum would just be, you know, whatever that first line item is. So it's not, you know, 25 um, NUPs or, you know, that's a, a common Oracle one. It would just be the, the first line of that subscription model. The right to audit is coming from the also. So not sure if we understand this question. Um, it's around the, the right to audit, right? So um, typically Oracle's audit clause is listed in the master agreement, so the OLSA or the OMA. Uh, in this case, if you are not an existing Oracle customer, then you wouldn't have one of these agreements with Oracle. And even if you were, then the audit language states that it's only for the products that are tied to that master agreement. So if you didn't have an ordering document or a purchase made for the Java commercial feature licenses, um, then there wouldn't be, um, you wouldn't, you could easily push back that it's not covered under a master agreement. Um, However, you know, we wouldn't be surprised if Oracle found a way around that. Uh, well, I guess but, the easiest way around that would be the security updates and patches. Yeah. So if you can run in an environment where you don't need these security updates and patches, it's going to be a little bit more difficult for Oracle. But as soon as you pick up that subscription, you're going to have to most likely sign a digital OSA or a digital OMA, and then they're going to give them the audit right. Uh, but if you don't do that, then again, you're kind of landing in limbo. And if you're making the modifications outside the BCLA and things of that nature, pretty much your company is just stealing IP. So it's kind of risky business. Yep. Um, okay, so here's another good one. So how to count virtual environments virtualized with VMware uh, or other soft partitioning methods? So Oracle's position, um, you know, they don't have a VMware policy. So what they rely on is their processor metric definition, and that states that wherever the Oracle software is installed and or running, and so they focus on the installation part of this, then that has to be licensed. So as long as Oracle stands by that position, and depending on the VMware version, you know, in an audit scenario, if they were to make you license, um, the, the cluster or the vCenter or across vCenters, 
uh, it would be the same for for Java. So um, so I would treat it the same. Yeah, I, I would agree. Well, and when Delia says they don't have a policy, yes, they do have a policy. They don't have a contractually binding policy. Um, yeah. What they have is just kind of like a white paper that says. Yeah, and the policy is around the soft and hard partitioning uh, methods, uh, not specifically around VMware. VMware is just a category yeah. as one of those. So something to keep in mind. The license assessment angle point does, will it be acceptable by Oracle? Um, Oracle is always going to want to validate but if our process and methodology seems to be fit, they may take it. Again, they're always gonna to wanna to validate. So they're still gonna to wanna to run their scripts. Um, what we're doing is, is mapping, but on both sides from us and the Oracle side, audit wise, there's a lot of customer declaration. Um, what is this application doing? What type of environment is it? A lot, a lot of these things you have to tell Oracle and there's no real scan for that. Right, um, so, you know, by working with us, you wouldn't be exempt from, uh, say, an Oracle audit. That's something that, as we mentioned earlier, uh, is Oracle's contractual right through their master agreement. What we can do is, based on our knowledge and our expertise, um, you know, we can walk you through what to expect, uh, how to go through the mapping process, uh, where Oracle is coming from, right? So both Nate and I are ex-Oracle LMS, and so we can provide you with that knowledge and uh, you know, give you uh, give you all the knowledge that Oracle is going to come to you with and all the questions and keep you one step ahead. Uh, what tools are required to map the Java environment without using Java usage tracker, for example? Um, what tools are required? So required tools. They're all, remember uh, Delia said earlier that they're all separate executables. So you should be able to hunt through your system just for the executables alone, Java SE, JDK, um, JRE, Mission Control, Flight Recorder, so all of the different commercial features are their own executables. So you should be able to hunt your system for those. There are some great tools out there. Uh, Flexera has a great package. Snows is being developed. SCCM works very well. Um, but then again, you could always just take those executables and plug them into your system and scan. Yeah, so what we've seen in the past is uh, a mix of clients relying on the third-party tool vendors. Um, and then, you know, we've also seen some clients that develop their own internal query. So once you know what you're scanning for, then you can also build something in-house and uh, look for those specific components, see if they're running in your, in your environment. Yeah, again, you, you scan for Java and you're gonna find it pretty much everywhere. So that's why, you know, once scan your for Java and map it to the servers, but then again, the next big step for us after you map it to your applications is map it to which vendors own those applications and then let them deal with it. If it's, if it's Oracle, you probably don't have to license it. If it's a third party vendor, you go to that third party vendor and say, Hey, what are you guys doing about these Java licensing? Because you sold us programs that have Java embedded. It needs to be licensed. Are you going to pay? Or are we going to pay? Most likely the third party vendor, if it's a large one is going to pay. Um, I think your primary concerns right now should be around your homegrown apps. Yep. Um, okay, let's see here. So we've got kind of a lot of questions here, so we're trying to get through them. Uh, can you provide more details about the commercial use definition? Is it related to customers' interactions or internal use that supports the business are considered commercial? So we actually have, there's one, there's a commercial features, and then there's a commercial use definition. That you can find it in what's called the Oracle Java Roadmap. Uh, it is. Let's see. Yeah. So, um, okay. So that's a great question. So it's important to understand the difference between commercial use and commercial user. So as far as what is covered, um, so Oracle's definition says that the commercial users are the entities other than Oracle customers um, that are using Java SE for free for business, commercial, or production purposes. Um, that are either developed by third party or internally versus a personal user, which would be uh, a specific individual who's using Java SC uh, for their personal desktop or laptop. So if it was, um, you know, part of a hobby or educational purposes, uh, then that would, that would be considered personal versus commercial users. Um, now, as far as commercial use, then, um, it really comes down to the language, the specific language in the binary code license agreement. So if it's, if you're a business and you're not using it for your internal test of purpose, 
then it would be commercial use. Yeah, pretty much. If it's not anything that's basic computing functions, yeah, I remember we said that they left it back and they left it back for a reason. So if it's not anything just basic <laughs> printing, emails, internet browsing, things like that, uh, it really just be, it comes down to what the device is doing or what the application is doing itself. Uh, say for instance, you would be running across devices, which is a desktop computer, or you can have an ATM. The ATM is performing a function specific role. Um, the application you develop is doing a specific thing. Say it's like um, managing an insurance customer's data and you built that off Java, right? It's doing something very specific. It's, it's no longer just general computing. So I would pretty much take everything that's not general purpose and consider that licensable. And again, remember, if you built an application, it's homegrown, or you wrote some language that's set to do something specific, uh, it doesn't really matter what you're using it for because most likely you've already modified the job anyways. And once that's done, it's licensable all across the board. Yep. Um, okay, let's see here. Is there any kind of ELA for our entities which can't participate in group-wide master agreements? Um, so this question is a bit broad. Um, I'd need to know a bit more detail to, to make sure I'm answering it correctly. But um, if you have an agreement with Oracle and the master agreement doesn't include all of your minority owned entities, then they can, you know, that could easily be amended or the minority owned entities could join in their own um, unlimited license agreement with Oracle. Yeah, most likely if you have the ULA, they're going to want you either, they're going to want you to pay up depending on the sizing because when they size the ULA, it didn't include those entities. Um, if yeah, and th this gets into a whole um, a whole other section of the languages, uh, the type of language that is typically found in the unlimited license agreement. So um, it can vary quite a bit. I mean, you can have a buffer. Uh, that gets nego negotiated at the beginning of the contract that basically says if you want to add any acquisitions or any other minority or ma majority owned companies, then you can do so as long as it meets the revenue buffer um, or you can just add them and you know, you'll have to um, you'll have to pay Oracle for that amendment or they can get their own depending on what the customer definition is um, for the, the current agreement in place. Yeah. You know, quick sales pitch, but when you're talking ULAs, either you review that contract very closely or you call somebody like us that specializes in these things. Delia was on the ULA team for a significant amount of time, but there's a lot of negotiation nuances that should happen from the very beginning. Uh, entities that are allowed to use the ULA is one thing. Uh, technical support caps is a huge one, right? Uh, you can get a ULA, which gives you a great deal, but if your support increases 2%, 3% annually until the end of time, at what point does a ULA no longer make sense for you? Um, so there's a lot of these little nuances you should look at. If you don't have a great understanding of a Oracle ULA contract, you should definitely consult somebody before jumping into one. Yeah, contract language is really important, especially when dealing with Oracle. Yep. Um, okay, let's see, what else do we have here? What about in the webinar chat? These are the ones that are coming in live. Um, let's see. Oh, that's a very uh... okay. So, um, so we've discussed licensing in VMware. So, um. Can an external customer bring his NUP license to access Java application on another company? Um, let's see. Oh, sorry, I lost my place. Um, another company server. Uh, so yes and no. So I would be careful with this. Um, yes, in the sense that, for example, if you're using software, um, that has license that has licensable Java, but that comes as part of an embedded product um, for another publisher. So say you know Adobe or SAP, then they would have to. They're the ones that would have to pay for that license. Um, but it's typically not a bring your own license model. It's typically through a redistribution agreement. 
Um, so it'll really just depend on the scenario in that case. Um, so as far as, you know, billing perspective, then, you know, you would have to work that out uh, with them. But the important thing to keep in mind is that you can't have mixed metrics. So if they're already licensing at the server model, then um, you're covered. But if, uh, you know, they're licensing at the server level and then you're trying to bring in your own NUP licenses, then um, that wouldn't be allowed. So the mix and match restriction applies to Java subscriptions as well? As far as metrics. Uh, like, what, on like a specific server? Mm -hmm. Oh, well, I mean, it's all going to be on the same application. It's going to be depending on the LPARs and the virtualization on that machine. If it's all on one machine, no, yeah, you're not going to mix the metrics. Right, and that's also from a functionality perspective. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think there's a follow-up to that one, you guys, uh, that you just saw. Um, we're, we're you know, just quick time check too, we guys, we've got less than two minutes left here. We might be able to answer one more question. What, what I would say, there are a few individuals here that are asking a number of uh, specific questions here. Um, for those of you asking the questions still, and obviously we haven't gotten to all of them here today, I, I would recommend that you reach out and we can have some one-on-one -on -one sessions further to, to better understand your situation and spend a little bit more time with you. So I encourage that if we don't get to your questions here. But yeah, we probably have time for maybe one more if it's a quick response. Otherwise, we're right up to the hour. Uh, is hosting for external customers permitted? Uh, is hosting for external customers permitted? So if you are, there's a separate Java license that we discussed earlier for embedded uh, when you're actually a host. So it's a totally different license model. Uh, it's not free. It's a proprietary licensing host, host model. Um, yeah, separate license agreement there, but yeah, it is licensable. So it is permitted, but it's also licensable. Yeah. Uh, we're actually getting the, the red light flashing on us saying we got to give it over. Uh, I hope we got as many questions answered as possible. Uh, me and Delia's names and emails are here for you. Catch us all, including our Angle Point team on LinkedIn. Uh, reach out to Alex and Scott, and they'll get all the rest of the questions to us. Maybe we can help you out. Uh, I hope this was informational enough. We tried to get it as best done, and we didn't see too many other Java informational sessions give as much detail of like what you should be doing or how we can help. So I hope that helped. And Alex, back to you. Thanks everybody for your time. Perfect. Thanks, Delia, Nate, and Scott for that great presentation, and thank you for all attending. Um, there is a link in the chat box um, to schedule a one-on-one -on -one call to answer any further questions that you might have um, for Nate and Delia. Um, you can also contact us through email or on the website, um, or you can contact Delia and Nate um, directly through their emails. Um, if you're interested in the next webinar for SAP's digital access, you can learn more on our website under the events section or register through the follow-up email. Thank you again for joining us today, and we hope you enjoyed it, and we'll see you next time. Bye now. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you all. Bye-bye.